All right, well, it is time to worship together. Um, before we begin, I do want uh, uh, to give a few announcements. Uh, number one, it is Food Bank Sunday, and there is still a little room in there. <laughs> Thank you all, those of you who donated, and it's a blessing to the community. Wonderful. Okay. Oh. Okay, there you go. Always good vibes. Yes, it's not oh. fair, so there you go. Excellent. Yes. Um, another thing is, is um, if any one of you ladies is size 7, on the green size, or knows somebody who is size 7, and might be interested in a smoky quartz ring and earrings, this is here for you. So it's been donated to be given out. So come, come see me and it can be yours. How's that? Indeed. Uh, also, remember we do have catechisms out there if you're interested in memorizing and teaching. Um, we also have baby bottles. There's a couple of empty baby bottles left, so I want to congratulate you all for taking them. And there are also already several that are filled, which is awesome. So I uh, look forward to seeing how that continues in a couple of weeks or so. We'll, we'll kind of close that out and we'll deliver it up there, and it'll be awesome. Uh, and also... We have a memory verse for this week. So, does anybody out there, did you memorize Genesis 2.24? No. You did not. Some, oh, Laura did. Excellent. I know. And, and Judah did too, but he said it last week. So, we need to find somebody else who memorized Genesis 2.24. Any of you? Well, then we're going to have Laura and Judah. Stand up. And let's have them. Now, the problem is they get from memorizing them out of different versions. But let's at least uh, uh, encourage them for how they are. Once we start, they're going to go, oh, I know this. I know. Right. Okay, so Genesis 2.24. For this reason, oh, sorry. Sorry. Genesis 2.24. 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 one we're going to be referencing in the sermon today, so there's no excuse. <laughs> Genesis 15, 6. Also, um, it's never too late to start late. Right? So don't be afraid. Pick up a copy of the verses. Um, it's, it actually does not take long at all. Judah and I just do it in the car after I pick them up from school. And it takes like 10 minutes. You know. <laughs> easy peasy, blind oh, crazy, or whatever it is. Okay, are there any other announcements you need to make? Yes. I just want to put a bug in your ears again. If you love to sing with your voice, but you're intimidated to be on worship team because you don't want to be the lead vocalist, it would be nice to have a worship team with people that can help fill the vocals or harmonize up there. There's some songs we really want to do, and it really is way more powerful than there's other vocalists. So if you love to sing and want to use your gift for the Lord, which he wants you to use your gifts for him, then we would love to have you join us on Tuesday nights. We do um, worship practice at 5. And again, you don't have to be the lead vocalist. You can just be accompanying or harmonizing. We need that. And instruments. Cheering. Instruments. Well, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, Brian. Anyone else? Then let us prepare for worship with prayer.
stand now for the call to worship from Psalm 62. For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from Him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress, I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in Him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. And let us worship together.
Amen. Now may the peace of Christ be with you. Let us greet one another in the Lord. Today's reading is in Isaiah 54, at verse 11. O afflicted one, storm tossed and not comforted, behold, I will set your stones in antimony and lay your foundations with sapphires. I will make your pinnacles of agate, your gates of marble, and all your walls of precious stones. All your sons shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the prosperity of your sons. In righteousness you shall be established. You shall be far from oppression, for you shall not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near you. If anyone stirs up strife, it is not for me. Whoever stirs up strife with you shall fall because of you. Behold, I have created the smith who blows the fires of coals and produces a weapon for its purpose. I have also created the ravager to destroy. No weapon that is fashioned against you shall prosper, and you shall confute every tongue that rises against you in judgment. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their vindication for me, says the Lord. Amen. Wonderful, thank you. Now if I could call the children forward, we're going, it's been a while since we've done this song, but it's audience participation required. I'm in the Lord's army.
for her safety and uh, knowing that you are watching over her mm -hmm. and uh, that you would just help that light that's inside of Luna to yes. just um, shine forth and um, help it um, uh, just that darkness that's in my daughter um, would just um, she would just see that she, how much she needs you and be able to just um, come to you, Lord. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and uh, just pray for the protection of both of them, Lord. <coughs> Father, I, I, I want to thank you for strengthening Frank and Colleen, Father, to join us today. Lord, I ask that you continue, continue work in the midst of their days that they cannot even conceive or believe. Lord, to strengthen them and renew them and refresh them um, in this time and season. Father, let it, let it be for your glory, Lord, in Jesus' name. close our time together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power I can call for the ashes at this time to receive the offer.
uh, Barbara Bloom on a regular basis, and she's been ready to either go home or for Jesus to come back for a long time. Yeah. And it's a good reminder that that is our home. Our home is with Him. And we do look forward to His glorious return because it's not going to get all fixed no matter what we do. We are sinners, and we are bound in the chains of all of that stuff. We do what we are able to do only by the Holy Spirit who lives in us. And the solution to the world's ills is not anything that we are going to be able to fix. When the Lord returns, that's when it will all be right. So don't lose focus on that as well, brothers and sisters. Okay, now let's turn to the Word of God. We're looking at Colossians chapter 2. And we're revisiting verses 8 through 15. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised, with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Or in it. We'll look at that. But last week, when we broached this subject of triumph from these verses, I opened with a reference to Super Bowl 58 that's coming up in a couple of weeks, fast approaching, and in fact, by the end of the day today, we'll know who the climactic matchup <laughs> will be. Will it be, as I tossed out last week, the Ravens versus the 49ers? Or will the Chiefs or the Lions pull off an upset win to move forward instead? <laughs> Either way, this is a clash of the Titans. This is the goalpost that all the games across the nation have been moving toward, and what we've all been waiting for, at least those of you who are football fans, I could care less, actually. Uh, but this is, sorry. Uh, you know, we all have our thing. This is the moment of triumph. Whoever, you know, outscores come February 11th, this is the place of triumph, that stadium in Nevada. That's what's really worth getting excited about. Except when we think about triumph as Christians, we rightly think about something radically different, ironically different. When we are brought to consider the moment of triumph and the place of that triumph, we are brought to an absolute overturning of the image because we are brought to a bloody and public an agonizing execution marking the triumph of the executioner state over a crushed criminal. Not anything positive at all, let alone remarkable, let alone triumphant, by no means. It's just the opposite. Except that it isn't. It's actually the triumph, the greatest triumph of all human history, intrigued. How could that be? Because it is there that God does his greatest work of all, beyond creation's wonder, which has its immense wonders. It is there that God's redemptive plan finds its focus, its fulcrum, and its fulfillment. Everything in his purposes moves forward to that moment and place. And from that moment and place, we always look back. 
Because it is the center. And it marks Christ's supremacy. The Apostle Paul explores a bit of that for us in these verses that we began to unwrap last week, presented in a series of thought and argumentation, beginning with Christ is enough. More than that, Christ is everything. Amen. And because of that, number two, being baptized into Christ is the new mark of identity, of belonging in the family of God. And that's all because the place and moment of triumph over sin and over Satan is in the cross, which means Christ is enough, Christ is everything. And we looked at that first point last week, so let's continue on building on that. Number two, second, being baptized into Christ is the new mark of identity of belonging in the family of God. Let's begin in verse 11. In him also you were circumcised. Wait, I was? Hold that thought. <sighs> verse 11 and continuing. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead, and you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him. Hmm. Now you have to read, not between so much as behind the lines, what is known as mirror reading. It has its limitations, yes, and it can become unnecessarily speculative and often does. But the basic premise of mirror reading is sound. That there is, this is what it is, that there is something very real and definite that lies behind the response and argumentation that Paul is espousing here, and we should be able to discern it. So when we come to these verses here, and as it develops from here, we read a lot about this issue of circumcision, and then it'll go on to talk about food laws, festival laws, Sabbath notably, we'll look at that all that stuff next week, do's and don'ts, etc. All of these, and circumcision preeminently, are related to and central to the belief system and faith practice of devout religious Jews as based on the dictates of the Old Testament, which, by the way, is in your Bible, which is fully inspired by God, fully the Word of God, and fully authoritative for our lives, rightly understood. And there's the rub. Because once Christ appears on the scene, God's promised Savior King beyond all hope and wonder, we can never view or practice the Old Testament exactly like we did before. But I mentioned Jews, right? Well, because evidently, the Colossian church was made up largely, if not wholly, of Gentiles. People from non-Jewish ethnic backgrounds, and Gentiles almost entirely, myself included. My parents made that decision when I was a baby. I know it was common practice. Everybody circumcised kids for a while, and I'm not going to ask which ones of you are or are not. Thank you. But just so you know, I am not. So I'm reading this and I'm going, in him you also were circumcised. And wait, no I wasn't. And if you were any other Gentile in the Colossian church, or anywhere else in the broader world that they knew of, they would say the same, no I'm not. No I wasn't. Right? Gentiles did not circumcise their sons. So it would appear that these fairly new, this is the church has only been around five years or so, Gentile believers were being influenced by the Jewish population of that city, you know, whether the Jewish synagogue or maybe a Jewish believer or some Jewish believers in the church there, to embrace the practice of circumcision in order to truly belong to the people of God. 
They were being pressured to adopt this practice and the practices of the Old Testament as necessary, or at least preferable, to attaining a higher, more enlightened, again, hold that thought for next week, level of faith and closeness with God. Okay, so these are Gentile Christians and they're not circumcised. And <coughs> circumcision was always the mark of incorporation into the family of God. We'll look at that in a moment. So the argument would go, well, you can't truly belong to God's people. You can't truly be a part of the Messiah's community if you're not circumcised. And this was causing a crisis, such that Paul had to, as we earlier saw, encourage them strongly to, chapter 1, verse 23, continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, and, and to encourage them to not be, chapter 2, verse 4, deluded with plausible, plausible arguments, uh, to not be, as here at the beginning of our section, verse 8, not be taken captive by whatever this philosophy of empty deceit might be. And Paul has to redirect them with the supremacy of Christ and insist on the supremacy of Christ. That's why that's out right there, out, straight out of the suit. Because they're losing sight of the supremacy of Christ. Getting lost back into the weeds before he appeared on the scene. Because Christ is the center of all things. As I mentioned, okay, so I've said it before, more than once, and I'm going to say it again because I want you to understand these three big F's. Christ is the focus of all God's redemptive plans. Christ is the fulcrum of all God's redemptive plans. Christ is the fulfillment of all God's redemptive plans. Plans and what Christ fulfills, okay, here it is. Christ transforms. The mark ordered in the Old Testament, yeah, it's still circumcision. And yet it's not. Because Paul says, verse 11, you've been circumcised. You uncircumcised Gentiles have been circumcision, and they'd say, and you might say, no, I'm not. But he goes on to explain that it's a spiritual circumcision. He says it's made without hands, and it's the circumcision of Christ that is associated with Christ or done by Christ. And then he tells us what it is by what immediately follows the explanatory participle. So language is intentional. Circumcision of Christ is having been buried with him in baptism. Verse 12, baptism being so richly symbolic of our death and resurrection in him and being joined to him in his death and resurrection. Our salvation, our incorporation, our belonging in him and to him. So it's a rich theological topic. Though the way that it's talked about with all this talk about circumcision, it might not seem like such a big deal to us, but that's only because we live so far removed from this moment. Because this truly is a transformative moment. And we're at the beginnings of that transformation in the scriptures. And it's a huge crisis that the earliest church had to wrestle with and resolve. So let's touch a little bit more, I'll be briefly about this transformation from the old mark to the new mark. Because the old mark of belonging was literal circumcision. Belonging to God in a saving relationship with God by the command of God. God issued this first to Abraham, known in the scriptures by the Apostle Paul himself in Romans 4 verse 11 as the father of all who believe. God issued to him back in Genesis 17, and that's after it tells us in Genesis 15, verse 6, that Abraham believed Yahweh, and he counted it to him as righteousness. That's the grounding template of salvation through faith. In Genesis 17, God commands Abraham to apply the mark of that faith 
the outward testimony, you might say, of that inward reality to himself and to his infant son and to all future sons and future generations to be circumcised. It, he says in Genesis 17, verse 11, it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. And it was circumcision for a reason. Well, well it was the cutting off of the foreskin of the penis. I know it's a little graphic. Uh, just as an aside, all of you will remember this, maybe the barges too. But when Judah was born, uh, we baptized him as an infant up on the plateau, outside service, and Virgil Iverson, Norma's late husband, he was the Old Testament reader for the day. And, uh, and so he gets up in front, and I have to sign Genesis 17 as the Old Testament reading, because it's the inauguration of the rite of circumcision as the sign of the covenant. Except that he didn't use a regular Bible. He pulled out the message. And you know something about the message is Eugene Peterson, bless his heart, sometimes just say, says things in a very obvious way. So we can say circumcision and we, can, we don't have to really think about what it means. It's just one of those fancy religious words. But Circumcision is the cutting off of the foreskin of the penis and it's in the message. And it's over and over and over and over. And Virgil is a big, tall, strong Norwegian with a booming voice. And he, every time he came to that word, Eugene doesn't say circumcision. He says, he says, who cuts the foreskin off of the penis. Every time he came to that, he said it with gusto. And I'm like... <laughs> so yes, that's what it is. So there's blood. There's male headship, because it's only the males that can be. Female circumcision is not God's idea. It never was, never will be. Uh, there's the generation of life, because that's where the seed comes. And that's all pointing forward to our new true head, the giver of life, the seed of the woman, Genesis 3, and of Abraham through his narrative uh, there in, in, in Genesis. But it wasn't just an outward act, a largely meaningless rite, a box to check off that magically makes you in, like sometimes how we have tended to view baptism down through church history, right? We easily slip into that as well. We did it for thou over a thousand years. Oy. Uh, so it's so easy to get sidetracked and off track just as much now as it was then. We're no different. But it was supposed to and always supposed to signify something much, much deeper, circumcision of the heart because it's fundamentally a spiritual issue and it's a heart issue. Issue. We know this from the Old Testament itself. Deuteronomy 10, 16. God commands, circumcise the foreskin of your heart. And it's something he promises that he, will, he, he himself will do because it's something that only he can do later on in that same book. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. And Yahweh your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love Yahweh your God with all your heart and with all your soul, that you may live. What a wonderful promise that is. Or as the Apostle Paul declares in Romans 2, verses 28 and 29, he says, For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. Well, yes it is. That's the outward sign of an inward reality. Here's what he says. But a Jew is one inwardly. And circumcision is a matter of the heart by the Spirit. Well, what is that circumcision of the heart by the Spirit? It is our regeneration. It is our new birth. It is our awakening to spiritual life with God in right relationship with God that is signified now in fact. So yes, 
Now, baptism is the new mark of belonging, the new mark of identity in Christ. And why? Again, going back. Because Christ is the crux. Christ is the focus and Christ the fulfillment. Everything was pointing forward to him and everything is transformed in him. In particular, the, the two sacraments, you might say, or ordinances of the people of God have been transformed from bloody rituals to non-bloody rituals. Again, why? You see, it's, it's not that God doesn't like ritual. He just wants to mean something. Right? Uh, again, why is it transformed from bloody to bloodless? Because, here it is, brothers, remember what I've been trying to drill in. Because all the blood was shed on the cross. All of the blood was pointing to him there, and all of the blood is fulfilled in him there. And so the Passover and sacrifices of the Old Testament, the shedding of an innocent and unblemished animal's blood, his life as the substitute for my own, are now expressed, we'll get to it next week, in the bloodless feast of communion, the bread and the wine, as the remembrance of the cross. And the rite of circumcision, the, the cutting off of the foreskin in the Old Testament, is now expressed in bloodless baptism, the water of the Holy Spirit joining us to Christ in that moment. Which is why when Christ issued his great commission to us at the close of Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 28, 19, to go and make disciples of all nations, the defining mark of that relationship by Jesus' own words isn't circumcision anymore. Go and make disciples of all nations. What's the participle that directly follows? Baptizing them. Just like here, verses 11 and 12, the circumcision of Christ having been buried with him in baptism. Oh, and raised to new life, it goes on to say, joined in him in his death and resurrection. As Paul likewise says in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, I want to just read those verses for you. He says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism in the death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. It's that, it's that image of immersion and emersion that is so expressive, so powerful. Okay, but if baptism corresponds to circumcision, it is the fulfillment and transformation of circumcision so as the sign of the covenant, as the mark of belonging, then there are, it would seem, some inherent implications for infant baptism. Because if, as Paul says in Romans 4, verse 3, that, quote, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, quoting from Genesis 15, verse 6, and that he then received the sign of circumcision after he believed and explicitly, Romans 4, verse 11, as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith. Okay, we're comfortable with that. And he was afterward commanded to circumcise his infant son and all forward progeny with that same sign that he took up. And if baptism now corresponds to and carries forward that same sign and seal, which it does, righteousness by faith. And I know that's a whole lot of ands. That's quite a track to follow. Then that sign and seal, it would seem, should rightly be applied to the children of believers as well. Okay, that's just food for thought. And I know among the elders, and there's only two of us, so, you know, we get chances for all sorts of... <coughs> anyway. We have differing perspectives on the proper subjects of baptism. And perhaps down the road, we'll have the opportunity to present both views in more depth for you to actively wrestle with as well. But regardless, 
Baptism is the new mark of belonging, the mark of identity in Christ, and it's all because of who he is and what he has done in his finished work on the cross. Yes, Christ is everything, and he transforms everything. Okay, and then third, speaking of which, right? The place of triumph over sin and over Satan is in the cross. In the height of potent irony, it is the moment of triumph. Let's pick up where we left off in verse 13, continuing on from there. Having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. And uh, that last phrase in the Greek is ambiguous. Is it in him, speaking of Christ, or is it in it, speaking of the cross, and it could go either way? And different translations take it differently. Or perhaps there's a bit of intended ambiguity where we're invited to think of both and, like in him, in it. Though I think the emphasis is on that moment, however, that place of the cross, because it's that turn upside down triumph, and triumph over the two big and chief ills, triumph over sin, which brings death, and triumph over Satan, the dominion of darkness. Like he said earlier in chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, which says, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now that's in re reverse order to what we have here, but it's the same two issues. The first triumph mentioned here is the triumph over sin, the forgiveness of sin, or what he calls here, trespasses. That's willful sin. That's knowing it's wrong and doing it anyway. That's crossing the line that God said here and no, no further. It's like what we put up on our property boundaries. If we want to keep people out, we say no trespassing. And some, many, sins we commit without actually knowing them or knowing that we did. But trespassing, huh? we knew. And we did it anyway. And the Lord forgives all that. There. Not just the unwitting sins. And sins of weakness and frailty. But those ones as well. What a blessing. What a freedom that is. Judah, now I don't know where he disappeared to. But Judah and I are reading through... The Psalms right now, uh, we already had this discussion, so he's right. And this week we were in, among others, Psalm 32, where David declares the opening verse. Verse 1, blessed, happy, free, before God, is the one whose transgression, similar concept, is forgiven. And he goes on, when I kept quiet and kept it all in, hidden in myself, I, I wasted away. But then, verse 5, I said, I will confess my transgressions to Yahweh, and ah, you forgave the iniquity of my sin. What a blessing that is. Do you want to know that freedom, that release? Come to the cross. It is here for you. And then Paul expounds on this moment of forgiveness where it's located by means of a descriptively potent image or two-pronged, two-part image expressing or fleshing out what this forgiveness looks like. Initially, the first prong it looks like cancellation. Or even better, more vividly, expungement. He talks about 
canceling, and the word there refers to actually wiping off or erasing the record of debt. And literally, that's a handwritten document of indebtedness that stood against us. That is, just kind of think of it, that is the long list of sins that we have committed against God because we've broken His rules, we have flaunted His, His will. It's like God has kept a record. Yeah, just written it all out. And He has, though it's not a literal list of pencil on paper, of everything wrong that we've ever done, and He holds it up in our face. We stand justly condemned, never eternally able to repay. And then he takes a great big eraser and right? Or in that day it would have been, you know, papyrus and scrubbing off the ink. But, and then holding it up again, right? But now it's a blank slate. I don't owe God anything anymore. Jesus paid it all. Like we sing in the words of the hymn. Jesus paid it all. And then our appropriate response. All to him I owe. And you can just keep singing. Sin had left a crimson stain. He was Sing that next week for communion. Okay. Yeah, just remind you. Uh, so that's the first prong of the image. The second prong or part of movement, it looks like nailing it to the cross, right? That's what it says. He says he took that expunged document of indebtedness, now all clear, and nailed it there, nailing it to the cross. Now that means enough to us as it is, right? What was rightly held against me is now attached and taken there. But the imagery is actually even more profound than that. Because one of the practices of ancient crucifixion was to write the crime for which that person is being executed and nail it over the head of the criminal on the cross so that everyone can see and testify that this is why and why it's just. We see an instance of this in the Gospel of John. Beginning at, uh, uh, in, in John chapter 19, the crucifixion of our Lord himself. And I want you to turn... There with me, if you are able, to John chapter 19. I want to begin reading in verse 14. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king! They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered. Those are the religious hierarchy. The highest, that's the pope and the bishops of the church in that day, if you want to call it that. You know what their answer was? We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to be crucified. So they took Jesus and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a school, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. All of the local and world religions, everyone, can at least read one, and usually two, and possibly three. 
So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not rise, the king of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Now you might wonder why Pilate had this statement nailed over Jesus' head. And it's potently ironic because it's the absolute truth. But it's also, and here it is, it's also Jesus' crime. The crime that the Jewish leaders try to get Pilate to change to is that he said he was the king of the Jews, a treasonous accusation. But Pilate wrote and said, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews, and insisted what I have written. I have written more than he knew. So that's the practice, right? And Paul says that these crimes for which he was crucified, these are your crimes. That's good. These are my crimes. And they have been doubly done away with, so to speak. Not just nailed there. He, he takes them. He takes them for me. But also he scrubs them off first and then takes them. <laughs> Absolutely. You can't get more... Definitive and potent image reason that absolutely and completely forgiven and free. What an amazing image. What an amazing Savior. Amen. Have you come to that Savior? Come today. So he's forgiven our sins. Wipe them all off. That document of condemnation. And nailed it to Jesus' cross. Done. And done away. All of it. There is nothing left hanging to condemn us if you have truly placed your hope and trust in Him. As it says in Romans 8 verse 1, say it with me if you know it. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None! Not at all. So, let's take this truth, this theological truth, some principle that we can say with our lips and just kind of leave it out there. No! Let's bring this down into the arena of your heart and life, your guilt and shame, your voice of condemnation that you say to yourself or you sense it from others that echoes in your soul, but is actually the accusations of the enemy. What's on that document of indebtedness that you keep pulling out and staring at, right? That God says is blank. What is that condemning sin that makes you think and believe that I don't deserve it and God doesn't really forgive me. Not really, not all, not all the way. I agree with that. Well, you need to understand and perhaps even demonstrably speak and act out that document, that condemning thing is actually nailed to that cross and is fully done away with there. What is it? Let's start naming some. Because I know that there are some of these in our hearts and lives and history that keep speaking the lie back to us. And you don't need to live in that condemnation. Like it's a slight against the Lord to live in that condemnation. He scrubbed it all off and he nailed it there, and Jesus took that death. It's been abortion. Have you had an abortion? Let's just be real and open and honest, because I know some of you have. And that can really torture us all. Is it adultery? Right? That's really bad, and it messes things up. And if, you're, if you come to Jesus, or maybe you weren't even in Jesus and you did that, that might just hold you captive. Is it a divorce? And all the trauma that unfolds from there. Because there's no pretty way of doing it. There simply isn't. Is it something that you lied? Or stole? Maybe that was years ago. And it just haunts me. Why? Because Jesus wants you to give that away. And give that up to him. And let him take it. 
Is it some besetting sin? Because we all have them. Like, right? We've talked about this before. Mine might not be yours and yours might not be mine, but we all have our struggles. Is it some besetting sin that you constantly struggle with and that wears you down? That makes you feel hopeless and keeps you defeated? Yeah. I struggle with that. Is it something yeah. Is it something horrible that you said or did years ago that keeps cropping up to accuse and condemn you and, and trap you, right? Take you captive out of the freedom that Christ won for you and me, praise God. There! The second triumph is triumph over Satan. Over the spiritual powers of darkness, it says, verse 15, that he disarmed the rulers and authorities. And these are evidently the spiritual rulers and authorities, like how Paul talks about in Ephesians 6, verse 12, where we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, further explained as against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So it says that he disarmed these dark spiritual powers that held sway over us and that he put them to open shame by triumphing over them in that cross. And the language here, once again, is very rich and vivid. The word for triumphing, especially so, and gives the richness of visual flavor to the whole because the word here in the Greek refers not just generally to some moment of triumph, like when whoever wins that upcoming Super Bowl. It means something more, something specifically more. It means to lead in a triumphal procession. That's the word. It's the same word we find in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 14, where Paul says, and it's translated as such there, at least in my version, that Christ always leads us in triumphal procession. It's the same image, but with a differently focused message. But it's the image of a Roman victory parade where the spoils and the captives from the conquered people are led through the streets of the city in public display. It's an extravagant demonstration of the enemy's defeat and plunder and of the emperor's glorious and utter Victory. We see that. Anybody been to Rome? Yeah. Sweet. Maybe you saw it. I want to get there someday. Today is not that day, but we can always dream. We see that practice displayed on the Arch of Constantine in Rome. And more poignantly for us who treasure the word and plan of God on the Arch of Titus, which depicts the triumphal procession after the fall of Jerusalem in A.D. 7. The victor's glorious and utter victory paraded through the streets, and now that victor is Christ. Not as some Roman emperor, but as a Roman criminal. Not at the head of some parade, per se, but, but hanging from an execution stake. And yet that's where the real triumph happens. And Satan and all his forces of evil in this world, they all know it. They all feel it. They are an abjectly defeated foe. And we are not under their dominion any longer. Whether that's overt dominion as in all the cultures down through time who have lived in fear and rightly so of the spirit world. In trading knowledge of the one true God for idols and spirits. We trade the freedom we have, or may have, in the provision he gives for our welcome. For the dominating fear of appeasing the spirits. Think, if only one, of the testimonies that come out of New Guinea. Before the gospel sweetly invaded there. Brutal, vengeful, treacherous, and cannibalistic. And then the gospel and triumphed over all that evil and fear in one thing, one place, 
one moment, the cross. Now you can read Peace Child by Don Richardson, for example. Wonderful book. If you're interested in exploring that, you know, that's just one instance, just one instance that has happened or sometimes still needs to happen. In cultures and societies around the world, the gospel changes things, brothers and sisters, and it changes things for the much, much better. And in our own daily lives here in the West, which is beginning to flirt more and more with a reversion back into spiritism in its various forms, that is a dangerous path to go down. And it's a dead end because there is no victory and life and hope there, only an angry and defeated foe who only seeks to devour and destroy and degrade, don't fall into the trap. But also we know that we continue to wrestle not with flesh and blood as we heard earlier from Ephesians 6. We are not subject to their dominion or their seemingly overwhelming force, however, because we have victory in the cross and we may have continued victory through the armor that is supplied from the cross. But we need to take up that armor and not be afraid to use it. Verse 13 of that chapter continues, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm because although they are far more powerful than we are, they are far, far less powerful. One Almighty, the Puritan William Gurnall wisely wrote, One Almighty is more than many mighties. And he is the victor. He pulled an upset maneuver, and he trounced and triumphed over them. And if you are in Christ, you are leading that procession with him. They are disarmed and defeated. And you, you are no longer under dominion. You are no longer in fear. It is God's ironic triumph, the triumph of the cross, the greatest upset in human history. And the focus, got it? Three S, got them? The focus, the fulcrum, and the fulfillment of God's wondrous salvation plan Everything in his purposes that came before, yes, moves forward to this place, this one event, and everything that follows after, always builds on and looks back to that one event because it is the moment of triumph. And Paul, in this section of this letter that underscores Christ's supremacy over all, unwraps this pivotal triumph for us, leading us first, as we looked at last week, to understand that Christ is enough. More than that, Christ is everything. And because of that, as we continue today, being baptized into Christ is now the mark of identity, of belonging in God's family. And that's all because the place and moment of triumph over sin and over Satan is in the cross, which demonstrably shows us coming full circle that Christ is more than enough. Christ is everything. So let us embrace that everything in Christ and in his triumph on the cross. Let us pray. That's a lot to soak in, but we need to soak it in. By your Holy Spirit, drench us in every level of our being to live, both to, to know, to understand, to feel, but also to live out. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we close our worship, let us stand and sing that wonderful new praise hymn, Yet Not I, But the Christ in Me.
May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his face upon you and give you peace both now and forevermore. Amen. May the grace of Christ our Savior and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Spirit be with us.